and geographic distributions. One we might car caricature as correlative and the other mechanistic. So with the correlative approach, we're basically going to assume, as I've just shown, that the current distribution of the species tells us something important about the ecological requirements of the species. That's our underlying assumption that we're working with. Okay? And that's the focus of all the methods that we're going to show during the week. We have to make this assumption that the current distribution, what we know about the occurrences, tell us something about the ecological requirements of the species. That's not always a great assumption. That's not always a perfect assumption. That's never a perfect assumption. Sometimes that can be a very poor assumption. But it makes sense, right, that that is a, a, a fair starting point, and that's the kind of point that we're going to be working with during the week. There is a fundamentally different way of, of looking at this, um, uh, 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 taking a more mechanistic approach, where instead of re requiring uh, relying on the occurrence records, we're going to instead rely on some fundamental physiological understanding of how the species functions, and there are some really cool models of out there work by a, a, number of, a, a number of really um, strong research groups around the world working with mechanistic um, distribution models, working with things like dynamic global vegetation models that take a much more mechanistic approach to modeling species, ecological niches, and geographic distributions. They tend to be very much more data hungry. Um, and as Towns pointed out, they tend to therefore be applicable to a, a much smaller selection of species, but they can be very useful. We're going to point you towards that literature, but it's not really what we're working with this, this week. We're going to focus on the correlative approaches that have the advantage of being more widely applicable um, to, you know, to, to, to address, if you like, more biodiversity on the planet that can be used to um, more characterize, if you like, realized niches versus fundamental niches, points of debate. But this is the important point for now, is that we are really focusing this week on these correlative or statistical approaches rather than the mechanistic approaches. We get a really, really good overview of the differences between these two approaches. Um, I pointed to a, a really nice paper by Michael Kearney, um, uh, uh, Kearney and Porter, which was in Ecology Letters in, in 2009. We can give you those whole references uh, in, in some way. Um, we'll, we'll make sure during the week that you get the full reference list. Um, but that, that was an important point to make to start with. So, some, some basic ecological theory. Now, now um, I know we have a lot of ecologists in the room, I'm not going to labour this too much, but it is really important, I think, that we start at the basics so that we're all on the same page here. This is taken from a, 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 a paper by uh, Ron Pulliam back in, in, in 2000, um, in, in, again in Letters. Uh, those of us schooled in, 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 in ecology um, uh, are comfortable, I think, with these terms that, and, and the work of people like Joseph Brunel, um, to the Brunelian niche and the Hudsonian niche. But this is a key thing that we're going to start working with during the week. This is now starting to think about looking in ecological space. So imagine that these are two ecological dimensions. We're going to refer to them as E1 and E2. This might be, uh, say, temperature. This might be precipitation. Um, we tend to think about an ecological niche as an n-dimensional space or, or a, an n-dimensional hypervolume might be another way of putting it. What we tend to do is, you, so, so each of those dimensions will be another um, kind of part of the niche, another, another dimension of the niche. We're going to often visualize things in two dimensions, of course, simply because that's the, 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 the only way that we can visualize it or, or, or some of the, the, the figures that we'll show are in three dimensions, but two is perfectly adequate for showing some of the key points. So what we're visualizing here are the, the um, uh, species occurrence records, are the, um, uh, the crosses, and in this case we, we're, we're assuming we have some species absence records, which are the open circles, okay? So all of those records that we have for the species occurrences can be plotted in ecological space. That is to say there is some say temperature or some precipitation that can be associated with a particular locality record. So we can plot it in environmental or in ecological space. Now what we tend to think of as, as, as the Grunelian niche um, would be this idea of drawing some sort of, again this is just, just conceptual here, simplified, drawing some sort of shape, some sort of oval 
around the known occurrences. And we're referred to this as the Grinnellian niche. That is simply, it's the areas within ecological niche space that define where the species can um, occur, or more specifically, where it can occur long term, where it can not just be, be observed at once, but where it can maintain a population, where it can maintain its full life cycle. So we'll refer to that as the Grinnellian niche, um, uh, the, the simple um, environmental conditions that define where the species can maintain the population. Uh, a Hutchinsonian niche, goes back to, to, to the work um, uh, uh, of Hutchinson, um, he kind of formalised um, the Grinnellian niche as a fundamental niche, that you, will, that you will have, I'm sure, come across that term. But then added to that is that well, species don't just, just respond to environmental, like the abiotic, abiotic environment, and I contrast abiotic to biotic, meaning the, the physical environment to the biological environment. Species respond to other species as well. So in this case, our species of interest, represented by the, um, the, the, the crosses there, hypothetically or conceptually is being outcompeted in part of its range by this other species. Um, represented by this dotted oval here. So this might be the fundamental niche or the Grinnellian niche of our species of interest, and this might be a competing species. So there's part of the fundamental niche that our species of interest doesn't actually occur in. So in effect, that's that fundamental niche gets reduced down to what we'll often refer to, and, and what Hutchinson referred to as the realized niche. So we go from the fundamental niche to the realized niche. They're really the, 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 the key points there. There's a couple of, of, of other things that I want to touch on, this idea of sourcing dynamics first. That is to say that you are likely to find some populations or some occurrences of the species that occur outside the fundamental or the Grinnellian niche. This might be the odd vagrant species that, that is, a, is a bird, it's a highly dispersive species that you, occur, that you observed in an area, but it's not really part of the fundamental niche of the species. It's not an area that the species could maintain a population long term. Um, so you want to think about this very carefully with your data sets. You want to think, are all these occurrence records that I have really true representations? Are they fair representations of the ecological niche of the species? Or could they be related to this idea of sourcing dynamics? So it's only um, it's, it's, it's the source populations that are actually then just kind of seeding these, these sink um, populations. Another key point, so, so the key point there is that you're going to get occurrences outside the fundamental niche. Another point here is that you're going to get absences within the fundamental niche for any number of reasons, but a, a key one is, is this idea of dispersal limitation. So it's not that all environments that um, are within the fundamental niche of the species will be occupied. <coughs> because the species may simply not have been able to disperse there. So you're going to get dispersal limitation. So we're already seeing that this nice and neat picture here, actually when we start thinking about some real data, is going to get muddy. We're not going to get all of our occurrences aren't necessarily within the fundamental niche, and we're not going to get all of our fundamental niche occupied by the species. Okay? So just very briefly, because we're, we're going to come back to this, what factors then influence the distribution um, or the geographic range of a species? And this is just in one slide, some very basic biogeography, that we can boil down to three things, essentially. The abiotic environment, that is to say temperature, precipitation, related back to these ideas of Grinnellian and, 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 and Hutchinsonian, or the, the, the fundamental niche. The biotic community, so interactions with other species. Species don't just respond to the abiotic environment, they respond to the ecological or the, the, the biotic um, environment. Species are part of the ecological communities, they're part of ecosystems, think food webs, think ecological networks. From those of you who come from maybe a, 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 a slightly different background, might have actually been schooled in niches from a more an Eltonian, thinking back to the work of Charles Elton. Um, the, the Eltonian way of thinking of niche is that the niche really is, is, a, is a species placed within the ecological environment, within the biotic environment, within an ecological community. So we're already seeing that the niche concept itself is, is very murky and muddy, but I'm just trying to point you in, 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 in some general directions. So you'll hear that referred to as, 
as, as Elton's niche. So we have the abi abiotic environment, the biotic environment, and then we've already touched on this idea of, of dispersal, so um, uh, or movement, history, and geography all also restrict the species um, uh, distributions. And we're going to hear a lot more about that. I think Karen's going to talk in particular about a really neat uh, framework that can be used, the, the, the band diagram um, that, that we'll talk about um, in, 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 in more detail. But that is a way of kind of formalizing this idea of the biotic, the abiotic, and, and movement as the three dimensions that influence um, geographic ranges of species. Okay, getting closer to actually talking ecological niche models here. Here are some diagrams that, that, that um, we put together a, a little while ago to, 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 to try and just, just get across some of these ideas. And, and again, we're talking very conceptually, um, and, and there are references here to, 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 to the book that Towns just referred to, and, and uh, actually a, a module that I wrote that was a kind of precursor to a book that um, is freely available online. Uh, it's published through what's known as the, the Network for Conservation Educators and Practitioners. If you Google me or Google the, the network and then look for niche modeling or species distribution modeling, you'll find it's a kind of 50 page synthesis with a uh, presentation as well. Some of these slides are from that presentation that tries to um, kind of act as a bridge between um, someone new to this field and getting into the, 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 the primary literature. So it's, a, it's really an introduction to, to, to the field. And, um, some of these figures are, are taken from there and then were updated and, 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 and um, expanded on, on in, in, in the book. So more information than, than we've been able to you know, go through in this, this half hour or so. So now let's contrast working in geographic space with working in environmental space. Okay? So this is the environmental space that we've just been working with, our ecological dimensions. Um, just, just looking at two ecological or, or environmental dimensions um, to start with. And then this is our geographic space. This is what we're used to working in. So X and Y might be latitude and longitude. It might be any number of other coordinate systems. But this is space. And we have a direct mapping um, between the two. So what do we know about species? We often know something about the distribution, and that is in the form of some occurrence records. So as we've just said, we're going to represent those with some um, crosses. And we can plot those in geographic space. So this might be, um, say, on a hillside, or there's no scale here on purpose, there's no um, north, south, this is just a conceptual geographical space. This might be uh, some continents, it might be a, a very small area just within one field, for example, but the, the, still the, the, the key points are the same. We can plot those points in geographic space and we can then also plot them in ecological space. So each one of these localities here has, um, uh, say, temperature and the precipitation associated with it, so we can plot it uh, ecologically. So let's start now thinking about some other parts of this, this niche and geographical space that we're going to use to frame the kind of questions that we're interested in. We're going to refer to the occupied geographical, sorry, the occupied distributional area. And it doesn't come out terribly clearly on the, um, uh, on the overhead here, but that, those are those light grey areas. Again, this is just conceptual. Um, these light grey areas here. Um, in, in geographic space. But let's say these are those areas of the landscape that are actually occupied by the species. And the first thing to notice is, well, there might be some areas, for example, this area A here, where we don't actually have any occurrence records for the species. So we don't actually know, our scientific or our expert knowledge doesn't know, if you like, that the species occurs there, but it does. Okay? So that's what we're going to say is our occupied distributional area. And again, of course, we can plot that back into ecological niche space. And we're going to refer to that as the occupied niche space. So this is the part of ecological niche space that is actually occupied by the species. So notice again that there are some areas, if you like this little area D here, that we don't actually have any occurrence records for. So that might be part of this area A here that might map into ecological space onto this area D. 
We don't actually have any occurrence records that tell us that that ecological space is actually occupied by the species. Again, we're going to get to some of the subtleties. If you start thinking real data, well, that's, that's going to be the case in most of, of our applications. These kinds of issues are going to, are going to come up. 